Well, hello, friends. Welcome one and welcome all. I can't offer much in this outdoor hall, but sit here and rest. You must be weary, and I'll share with you Tales of Tyria. <laughs> Welcome one, welcome all, this week on Tales of Tyria. We've got some great news from the front. We've got a discussion on MMO game mechanics and maybe some discussion about games we've been playing recently. Stay tuned. Welcome one, welcome all, welcome to another exciting episode of Tales of Tyria right here on the Sound Strategy Network. Talesoftyria.com is the website. I am your host. I go as Bridger. And with me, as always, is my cohort of co-hosts. Though strictly not true, because a cohort is a specific number of men in the Roman Legion. Uh, Freelancer, can you help us out with there? Uh, that was just fail, Bridger. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 welcome to the intro, Sidekick welcome to the show. Or, uh... We've got a great show for you today. Uh, yep, check out the website. This is episode number five. We are talking about uh, game mechanics, specifically MMO game mechanics and, and the actual methods through which you interact with the game. What is it you do other than just make decisions? So we'll be talking all about that today. Let me introduce all my co-hosts, as you can see, gathered around me here. Uh, Freelancer already revealed himself to us there. He is... Uh, from TeamLegacy.net. Welcome, sir. How's it going, Bridger? Not bad. And also joining us, as always, we've got Great here, in from the luxurious abode in Yukon. Hey, hey! <laughs> Same place. <Great> Yukon. <laughs> and uh, also joining us, the ever-mysterious symbol of power that is Gigawatt. Welcome. <laughs> Still a symbol. <laughs> Still a symbol. One day, sir, one day you will not be able to hide behind your mask. And also joining us, we have Aku again as welcome. Welcome. What's going on, guys? So, ladies and gentlemen, we actually have some news to discuss this week. I am ever so happy. Uh, well, let's start with the big news of the week. There is a new blog post on the ArenaNet forums, um, the Guild Wars 2 development update, which gave us three large chunks of data to digest. Uh, they talked about the Engineer Tool Belt, they talked about uh, Rangers Pets, and they talked about cross-profession combos. Did anybody have any immediate reactions upon reading this? Anything they were particularly excited about? Uh, Ranger Pets, definitely. I thought that was awesome. Um... I know you liked. Uh, you were telling me you liked the the cross class combos, but I got to tell you, all that ranger information they released was pretty neat. I don't know if I'd like the fact they uh, don't really have a defensive stance, but we'll get into that later, I'm sure. But um, but yeah, that was my favorite news. I noticed that too, actually, myself. I noticed that they did. They left out. They had aggressive and passive, no defensive stance. So. That's uh, going to be interesting. I, we'll see. I Any think aggressive basically is defensive, though. From WoW, from what I got. It seems like it. It seems like it. There just but is no Did anybody ever aggressive. use aggressive stance? Like, yes, I want my pet to always go and attack everything near me all the time. Botters. Yeah. Gold farmers. <laughs> Botters. <laughs> <Gold farmers. laughs> I guess that's one way to do it. Okay. Well, and you're gathering mats, you know, in a low-level area. I set mine to aggressive, you know, and just let it run around and kill everything. I just collect the spoils. I mean, I'm sure a lot of players did true that. True enough, true enough. I don't want to have to hit a hotkey to send it off to attack something. That's too much. Too much work. Um, so I guess we'll uh, we'll start with the pets then. Um, they, they talked about specifically the fact that uh, in... Guild Wars 2, rangers, of course, will have pets similar to the hunter in World of Warcraft, and they'll have a special bar where the pets will get uh, skills that they can use. And similar to, um, to WoW, but still a little bit different, is 
the fact that the pets are going to have four specific abilities, and this is this is a lot of changes from previous understanding about the the ranger and the pets. But they will have the pets will have four specific abilities. Three of those abilities will be determined by the family of the pet. Like if it is a bear, all bears will have these three abilities. However, the polar bear will have a fourth special ability that is different from a grizzly bear, which will have its own special ability, which is different from a black bear, which will have its own special ability. Which is kind of a cool way to provide a unique. Uh, s sort of unique flavor to each pet, but still not have an overwhelming number of, of things going on. And I have to say, it seems like there's more to these pets than there is to pets in WoW. Would anybody else agree to that? Yeah, I mean, considering you can now almost... I mean, you ha you had unique skills in WoW. You could uh, uh, get, you know, if anybody remembers the rake, you know, certain pets uh, had particular abilities than others, and then as with, I didn't play too much into Cataclysm, but they just completely wiped the slate with pets and made them all pretty much the same exact thing, minus the species. But from what I read, Bridger, like the polar bear has a, a kind of like an AOE freeze. I mean, mm -hmm. whereas another bear may have an AOE uh, buff that's like a defensive buff. Um, it's, uh, you know, it depends on how many species and stuff there are, but if they're going to go all out with it, I think it's really cool. Yeah, I'm I'm really excited to see what kind of things they've got going on with that. Anybody else uh, comments on on the on the Rangers new, the pets new abilities? I was kind of disappointed in the fact that uh they did take out the uh, the evolution of the pets. I was mm -hmm. kind of looking forward to that, but you know, uh I guess uh I I guess I'll take what uh I guess I'll take what they uh they gave us. So. <laughs> and that was my roommate sneezing, bless you. <laughs> Yep, the, uh, the the evolution that you speak of, it did sound really interesting. The original uh, situation that they released for the pets was the fact that pets would start with uh, sort of a low level, and as, as you fought with them, they'd sort of level up with you, but they'd gain new abilities, kind of like the talent tree system, it sounded like, that the hunter in, in, in WoW had, where they could give their pets, or they had their own talent tree, and you could slowly give them new things over time. But um, this this certainly feels a little bit more like Guild Wars 2 because the other thing they talked about was that you'd be able to have two pets in combat and you'd be able to hot swap them. And they didn't say that rangers couldn't hot swap their weapons either. So this is in addition to being able to hot swap your weapons, you can hot swap your pets, which is kind of cool. Yeah, they uh, they mentioned the fact that if one of your pets goes down, you could essentially, you know, instead of reviving him or waiting for him to be revived, you could uh, quickly bring in your new pet um, your secondary pet, so to speak, and that's kind of a cool thing. I mean, because what if you're in the midst of, um, you know, a really thick battle? You don't have time to sit there and and do a revive, or you know, who's to say your pet's even around to revive, or you can't get to them, or whatever the mechanics might be. But the the fact that you can almost uh, um, I feel so awful saying this. It's almost like Pokemon, you know. It's like throwing out. <laughs> it's like throwing out. A turn. Oh I my god! You polar bear, you know. <laughs> it so. does kind of sound like that. If there was only three, if there was three pets that you could choose between, <laughs> one of them would be fire. Six, one of them would be water. <laughs> But, but actually, just like switching, just like switching your weapons, though, you know, you have a bear, which is like they said, kind of a big damage absorption. You know, not any big surprise for anybody. But let's say you wanted to throw out like a DPS or like maybe some sort of cat. Um, the fact that you can on the fly switch these uh, pets around uh, that does add some uh, strategic value. I like it. Definitely, I could I could totally see a bear that's dis you know bears probably have a lot of control type abilities like knockdown or things like that. And so if you're trying to get away, maybe you pull out a, a a pet that can help you escape by you know getting your opponent stunned or slowed or something like that. But then if an enemy's trying to get away from you, you get a pet that's fast and that has the ability to slow the enemy as they're running away, things like that. So that would be that would be really interesting to be able to swap between those two different kinds of things. Um, so I'm still I'm, I'm very excited about that. Even though I probably won't be playing a ranger right away, um, it sounds really cool. Especially the fact that you're going to be able to have two terrestrial pets and two amphibious pets. I'm sorry, two and two aquatic pet slots. And I'm guessing that uh, it says amphibious pets can also be an either. So you could probably have the same pet in both if you chose like a frog. 
I don't know, whatever. <laughs> amphibious pets they have for ghosts. <laughs> I can't think of an awesome amphibious pet off the top of my head. Maybe a crocodile would be an uh, amphibious type pet. Um, fierce and your get you. Um, so yeah, any any last uh, comments on the ranger update here? Uh, the pet management system is very elegant. Once you uh, tame a specific species, you will unlock that species, and you can then basically it's in a bank of what you have, and you can just click the slot and mm -hmm. switch it to whatever you want. It kind of takes away some of the immersion of you know the idea of going out and charming a pet and then oh this is my pet and i can name him and and then you know have to stable him i mean the fact that you take you make everything like that more convenient takes away the immersion and the connection so you kind of lose something with that even though i don't know you really just are going to have to find out how it feels it i feels mean like i guess uh... way. sorry go ahead i mean i guess it would be uh, sort of the same in the sense that um when they actually, in, in the sense that when you are actually to, able to switch out your pet, you know, mid-combat, it's kind of just like, all right, you just died. All right, henchman number two, let's do this kind of thing. It's just like the, uh, the I guess, the, uh, the love, so to speak, for having a single pet or for having multiple pets is kind of gone, but we'll see how it goes. Yeah, they're going to have to add a cooldown or, or something because, there is. I don't know, I mean, yeah, there's going to have to be. I, I know there's there a... is, but... If I have my, my bear that's, well, let's call him Decoy, and he's running out and, um, you know, drawing a bunch of fire, doing roars and stuff, and then, uh, yeah, well, I don't know. It's just there's going to have to be some balancing there. I'm sure they'll they'll do just fine doing that. But uh, Rangers, I could see them, you know, over a little overpowered with different pets that have different snares and stuff if there isn't any such cooldown, so. All right, so let's move on then and talk about the... Let's, let's go to the, the engineer update that they have here, tinkering with the tool belt. It's not too much of an update other than the fact that they just wanted to tell us, you know how we had that tool belt idea and it worked with some of the skills? Yeah, now it works with all the skills. Every single utility skill, every single healing skill now wor has a tool belt related skill that goes with it. So that's pretty awesome. I think it's just, you know, it's pretty much something that we knew was probably going to happen, but this is just confirmation. Yep. Engineer is now more awesome than he was previously. Which is actually what the Ranger update was, too. Ranger was this That's awesome, true. now he's this awesome. The difference is this much, so he just got this much more awesome, just so you know. And they put that into text, text form. I just see the Engineer being, like, you know, mediocre at everything and excelling at nothing. Uh, I, I can't get excited well, about that. Well, I think Defense is going to certainly be his strong suit because he can put down a whole bunch of turrets and really control an area. You can use a shield, too. That's true. So, Engineer's definitely going to be interesting. It's, I still am uncertain about whether I would like to play an Engineer, but I know there are a lot of people that are super interested in playing an Engineer. All right, next up, cross-profession combos. Now, this is one of the things that I thought was really awesome. They talked about... I mean, we've seen and they showed off the cross-profession combos in the past, and... It was, I think the only two they ever showed off was like firewall plus throw something through it and that electrical field plus shoot a gun and it creates a stun kind of a thing. And it was like, yeah, that seemed kind of gimmicky when you only show two of them. But now that they've mentioned that every single weapon is going to try to have an initiator and a finisher and they're all going to try to work together, that's, that's pretty awesome, I got to say. Definitely. Yeah, I'm actually, uh, I'm really proud I don't know if proud's the right word, but, like, pleased <laughs> is probably a better word. Pleased to see, like, they actually put some time into the class combo thing. Because before it felt, like, kind of gimmicky. Mm -hmm. Like, really gimmicky. Almost like trebuchet gimmicky. And, uh... <laughs> We're bringing it back. <laughs> I'm just bringing it back. But, uh... I feel... It's trebuchet. It's stupid, but... I felt like they were just like, oh, here's this extra little tiny thing you can do. But now it feels like they actually put some time into it. And it's going to be something really... Interesting. It's going to really be what's going to make different teams different from one another. It's going to be that deciding factor. Oh, I should point out, for those of you that don't know how the uh, tool belt system works, because there's a couple of people in the chat room asking, um, the way that the tool belt system works is that for every utility and heal skill, but not the elite skill, obviously, most of the utility skills that the engineer has are some kind of kit, like a grenade kit or uh, a, a 
a turret kit or something like that. So using the skill gives you access, or like a flamethrower kit, gives you a flamethrower and a couple of options with the flamethrower. Or using the turret puts the turret down. So it you, you kind of lose an active damaging or healing or other kind of slot there because putting that thing there means you give up some kind of active ability to have a kit instead, which gives you versatility but less active things that you can do. So what they've done is create sort of where the pet bar would normally be. You'd get four slots for a tool belt and each utility skill that would put out like a, um, a turret or give you a flamethrower also has a new skill that gets slotted in that tool belt. So when you put in it, when you, whenever you hook up a utility skill, boom, you get a new tool belt skill specifically for that utility, uh, which is kind of a cool idea. So I hope that makes it clear, even though it's, it's difficult to describe it without actually seeing it on, uh, on, on, on person, in person. Now, this is beyond my knowledge. Um, can we assume that I can lay down a turret and then switch to the flamethrower kit? Or is yeah, the turret so. going to be destroyed if I switch kits? No, because they're different utility skills. So you'd have the turret is one utility skill, the flamethrower is a different utility skill. And I think that the the tool belt skills are all usable no matter what state you're in. Like, you don't have to have your flamethrower out in order to use the flamethrower utility skill, or uh, tool belt skill, for example. At least that's yeah. my understanding. I mean, there's the that, example that true. they gave. Um, if somebody's confirmed. got a flamethrower, incendiary ammo is the tool belt skill. So the fact that you have a flamethrower with you allows you to use incendiary ammo. And if you have the, the, the skill slick shoes, that might you know, cause your opponents to trip or something. I don't know exactly what it does. But it would then, if you use it as a, as a tool belt skill, it gives you super speed. So you slick your own shoes instead. So I think that's kind of the idea. It gives you two different things to do on the same vein. So the flamethrower kit will give you a flamethrower, and it'll let you use incendiary ammo as a separate thing. Two things for price of one. It's great. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, back to the cross-profession combos. I am just so happy that they flushed it out and made it more than just a bit of a gimmick. And the fact that some classes can, or some weapon anyway, some weapons can, you know, set up a combo and then finish a combo. Or you can set up a combo, then switch to a different weapon and finish it. That's a pretty cool concept. Yes, assuming you can pull these off quickly. I mean, mm -hmm. you got to imagine in a, uh, I don't know, world versus world scenario. Um, I mean, imagine two groups of people trying to do these combos. Unless it's a ranged combo, it's just not going to work. So if you're, let's say, a thief trying to pull off uh, a dagger type combo. I mean, can you really see that happening in the middle of a, you know, a mass of people? Well, I know that all of the initiators basically provide some area of effect ability. Like they gave the example that the um, the the elementalist freezes the ground in an area of effect. So it's a visual thing that everybody can see. Okay, there's an initiator happening right here, and it's ice. And then the warrior can come and stomp the frozen earth. Poof, and then grant frost armor to nearby, nearby allies. So this is something I think that you can do within a small group, but I don't think it's something you're going to necessarily work together as like a guild to pull these off. Each individual subgroup within the guild might be like, oh, hey, Frank, I'm going to lay down some ice. Here you go, kind of a thing. So that you could just give that, and they could see it and easily know, okay, there's the thing I want to do, bam, and then it happens. Yeah. Yeah, my, uh, my main concern was actually in that big group of you know, people trying to pull off these combos. If, uh, you know, an elementalist, you know, puts down an ice, uh, you know, an ice area of effect, and you have, you have like three warriors in the middle, in the middle of it, one of them hits the, uh, one of them hits a move, and all of a sudden they waste that, they waste that initiate, uh, that, that initiate for, uh, something that they didn't necessarily want to happen at that exact time. So it would be kind of, kind of confusing and kind of almost, uh, tedious to actually get it going with like a mass amounts of people so yeah i mean the the i think the sentence that's important is they said almost every weapon has some sort of initiator or finisher which leaves two players ample opportunity to find and capitalize on the combo so it doesn't seem like there's a huge number of these so that they're going to accidentally happen when you didn't mean for them to happen because almost every weapon has one or the other some of them probably have both and some of them you can switch from one weapon to the other one real quick and get it going but um, you know, I don't think it's going to be so ubiquitous that that's going to be a problem. At least that's my hope. So. It was just brought up in chat. Like, can uh, enemies finish your, the initiators? Cause, so, like, that's a good question. If, 
I know that's a really good question. I don't know if that's actually possible. How crazy would that be if like someone could steal your like ice AOE or something? It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> or if we do get within melee range of you know. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Nobody else is hearing that except for you guys. That's my bad. That's a... <laughs> if we do get within range of a, um, you know, of of an enemy raid, for example, imagine laying down a a, a field of fire or an aura, right? And you tell your engineer to throw a particular bomb into this area, and it's supposed to cause this huge explosion, but your engineer dies. <laughs> so all of a sudden, if these enemies can use your your aura, imagine the amount of flame arrows coming at you now, you know, or or along those lines. I don't think. I mean, let's let's think about this for a second. I don't think it's going to be uh, where enemies can use it because you can you imagine the issues with that? It's yeah. just yeah, they didn't say one way or another, so you didn't hear this from freelancer, but you're not going to be able to use RS. <laughs> I don't think so either, honestly. <laughs> I, I, that just just caused too many problems yeah. gameplay wise. I don't. I think that's something they just say. Yeah, disabled. <laughs> it caused less I mean... problems for them. If anything, if anything, we might see not you know the opponent stealing your your combo, so to speak, but you might see uh, counter combos. I'm just kind of thinking of it in a, in a fighting game kind of in a, in a fighting game kind of mindset where uh, if if the opponent sees um, some sort of AOE go down, they say, okay, get ready, you know, let's all let's you know necromancers put some sort of uh, shadowy aura down and get a warrior to stomp on us, make us all stealth. They can't see us now. That kind of thing, Qu sort of like counter combos i mean that's the most i'd see in terms of the opponent maybe taking advantage of that but i don't know we'll, we'll just have to see i think we're looking too much at like a pvp perspective here of this combo initiator thing and i think probably the biggest reason they have this class combo thing is for the pve end mm -hmm. so you could be out in the world and you know you're you're fighting like a giant centaur and you're about to die and then like the guardian puts up a shield and you know you heal up and then you can use like the shield to do the dagger combo that they mentioned with the thief, and so you're able to do like sort of help one another without being in the party, without doing the same quest. He, someone can toss you like a fire ring or whatever to try and help you out, or some of some like the bosses or dynamic events. They might be easier if you have these combos in them. Yep. Yeah, you bring up a good point there. I mean, it's uh, it definitely. I mean, imagine doing the the raids and stuff aside from dodging attacks that actually force you you to move you know like we had seen in the couple of reveals we've had so far uh having to do these class combos with friendly players you know um so instead of again instead of just sitting there doing pressing the same four buttons like we talked about a few episodes back um you're not only having to physically watch what's around you but you have to also to be efficient um set up these little uh tangents with other players in your raid. So I, I think that's pretty cool. Or your group, I'm sorry, not raid. All right, so let's move on to the next bit here. We've got a couple other quick links to talk about, uh, at least uh, links of the week. I'm gonna, I'd mean, i like to I like to throw up things that aren't necessarily news, aren't necessarily things that are going to spawn huge amounts of discussion, but things that you might want to check out because they're, you know, it's, it's not worth regurgitating everything on this webpage, but you should go check it out because it's awesome. Um, I don't know, have you guys read anything about the, in this link that I sent you to uh, the post, we need to talk religion? Humans and polytheism. Did anybody else read that? I glanced through it. I mean, it, you know how I am, Bridger. It's <laughs> PVE stuff. And, uh, <laughs> Did any of you guys? This is the best edition. Come on. <laughs> yeah, well, I like to. We're, we're one, one at a time, one at a time. So um, I, I read through this and I thought it was fantastic. This is basically a lighthearted conversation between one member of each of the different races in Guild Wars. And it apparently is, is intended to be a six-part or five-part um, series of conversations between these characters where they discuss the different viewpoints of the various characters. And this first one is about humans and the gods that they worship within the realm of Guild Wars, which is, I have to say, extremely informative and very fun to read. It was, it's very well written. It, it has a lot of tongue-in-cheek, and the characters really feel like they know each other well and are ribbing each other as friends would do, but also like, you know, kind of insulting each other's things a little bit and some, some tempers get flaring. And anyway, it discusses the six gods of the humans and what, you know, the humans believe about them. And it's, it's a very cool 
read. And I was extremely impressed by the quality, so I wanted to link you to it. You'll find a link to this and all the other news posts that we're talking about here in the, um, in the, in the show notes. Com. So let's, uh, with that, move on to the next section here. And this is another very quick bit uh, of, of awesome. Uh, this is a little write-up on the heroes of Guild Wars 2, Destiny's Edge. Destiny's Edge is the adventuring guild that you sort of meet these heroes throughout the game. Uh, they're the main ones that are featured in the video that was released earlier. Uh, Kaith is the Silvari Thief. Zoja is the Asuran Elementalist. Ir Stegan... Steganalkin? Something. <laughs> is a Norn Ranger. And uh, Ritlock Brimstone. I love that guy. He's got such a fantastic voice if you watch that trailer. Yeah. And it's got a great name, too. I wish I could have played a char named Ritlock Brimstone. Oh, that's fantastic. And Logan Thackeray of the humans. So this is a little primer, basically, on uh, the different heroes that you can find there. That was really cool. Um, and a follow-up interview with John Peters was found on MMORPG.com with tiny bits, bits and pieces here about the, uh, the pieces that we just talked about earlier, about his post on the blog with the cross-profession combos and the ranger changes and the, uh, prof and the profession changes for the engineer, etc., etc. And uh, there's also, if you are new to following the game, I found a series of videos on Reddit here that are fantastic at sort of introducing you to the game. So I'll leave the links for all of these on the webpage. TalesofTurios.com is uh, the page where you can find that. Just search for episode number five. All right. So moving on, let's move on to our main show here, the roundtable discussion. Let's talk about game mechanics. And when I say game mechanics, I don't mean, well, this time I get a sword and this time I get a, a hammer. Or I don't mean, you know, oh, well, he's got green armor, I got blue armor. I'm saying, what do you do when you interact with the game? What do you do? Do you click on an enemy's head to try and kill them in Counter-Strike? Do you, you know, click on an orc and tell him to go harvest some wood if you're in Warcraft 3? Each of those is a different mechanic. The clicking to move, the clicking to shoot, the moving through a 3D environment, that's first-person shooter type mechanic. These are how you interact with the game. So, how do you interact with MMOs? The typical thing that you do is you make decisions. That's the primary thing that most MMOs, you have to make decisions. Everything's about opportunity cost. Right now, you can do a multitude of different things. Can you... Put up a defensive spell? Can you put up a debuff on your opponent? Can you attack them right now because you're in melee? Or well, maybe you'll switch to something and shoot them in range with a range spell. Each of these things you can do, but you only have so many seconds to do it in, and you have to do it within a certain conditions, when they're close to you, when they're far away, when they're not looking, when they're knocked down, etc., etc. That's the main thing that I think pretty much all MMOs share. Would I be right in saying that, do you think? Yeah, I do. Um, yep. At least up until Guild Wars 2. <laughs> <laughs> oh, got him. We already started there. So, um, in a bunch, of, a bunch of these games, you actually have a lot of sort of sub-mechanics. Each class, almost, has their own sort of sub-mechanic above and beyond the normal opportunity cost decision-making thing that, uh, that all MMOs share. For example, in World of Warcraft, the rogue has a combo point system and an energy system that they have to balance. Combo points sort of like a push-your-luck mechanic, where... You know, you build up combo points by attacking the opponent with certain skills, and then you can finish them with finisher skills that have different advantages and disadvantages. So that's one example of the kind of mechanics. And then you have mana pool is a typical mechanic. Certain spells that are big and powerful cost lots of mana. Mana regens slowly, so you have to tra make the decision of what's the trade-off. Do you want to use the mana efficient spells right now, or do you need to use burst at DPS and try and use, kill them as much as fast as you can, and then if you run out and they're still there, screw you. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so there's all kinds of mechanics. Let's start by saying, what do you guys think is your favorite kind of class-based mechanic that you've had in any MMO, or even any kind of mechanic? How do you interact with the game? What do you think? Hmm. Um... I've pretty much only played, and all the guys in chat that know me, I'm a huge, huge fan of rogues. I'm a huge fan of, uh, uh, don't, you know, uh, hate on me, but, uh, co you know. Stun locking stun bastard, yeah, that's what you are. Like one, two, three, four. I was like trying to figure out a, a nice long. way of wording it, but, uh, 
<laughs> there was no so nice it, way to word that. It, it's, I'm more sorry. Like, it's more like Stein than forward slash laugh, forward slash poke, <laughs> Stein again, <laughs> forward slash laugh, and then poke, you know, and, and then a kidney shot, and then forward slash, and then right when they get out of their stun lock, vanish. <laughs> So you're a troll then. You like the troll mechanics. And then and then it's like, okay, they're just sitting there like, this guy just wasted 20 seconds of my time. And then I ambush him for like two shots and like they're dead. (laughs) No, um, I I love rogues. I I love the mechanic of rogues. And and it's not just WoW. I mean, Aeon had a similar system for their uh, assassin. Uh, A lot of games built on that idea, just that you, the more attacks you do, you know, the, um, the bigger uh, finishing move, so to speak, you can use. Um, you know, uh, it's. I, I don't. I hope that it, they have some sort of related system going into Guild Wars too, because I enjoy that. It, it makes things dynamic. You know, you mentioned mana. Um, one thing with mana uh, classes that use mana or rage or uh, whatever it might be, depending on the game you're playing. Uh, it's it's always the same skills. It's always the same setup. You know, you always do. You always open with the big heal or or this particular skill because it's you know that's your normal opening. But with a rogue, the reason I like it so much is I have a very short attention span. And one thing the rogue does, <laughs> I mean, I'm just being honest here. It, one thing the rogue does is forces me to make on the fly decisions. If I so happen where I can't get my fourth combo point, and I'm stuck between a rupture and a uh, and a kidney shot, for example. You know that is an on-the-fly decision that I have to make, and it's completely based on the type of class I'm playing. Yeah. Whereas, let's think about a mage. Okay, what does a uh, an arcane mage do? No matter what, the same exact skills over and over and over. And maybe that's just because of the blast. Yeah, it's maybe it's because of the classes, and that's not so much the mechanics' fault. But there you go. That's why I love Rogue. <laughs> Actually, you kind of echo my desire to have games that force you to think on your feet and make decisions in the moment based on dynamic conditions, because I find those to be significantly more exciting than ones where you plan something ahead of time and then simply execute it when it comes time to, you know. Oh, no, I'll, I'll get you. I'll one up you right here. What does a warlock, a shadow priest, do no matter what? If some, if if uh, my little gnome butt comes up behind them, they fear you. God, <laughs> it, oh. it depends on the spec. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah, dude. Destruction I'd warlocks like... play totally different from others, dude. You're right. You're right. Mo- I, I'd say. All right. Let's let's be realistic. Ninety five percent of warlocks will will instantly cast fear. Because they don't know what to do. And then they'll throw a bunch of dots on you because they still don't know what to do. And they'll just do what, they'll just spam buttons because they still don't know what to do. That's Freelancer um, is going to be like the Rush Limba of our show. He's going to say completely inflammatory things that cause people to write in and say, <laughs> Why don't you play a caster, Freelancer? Clearly. You see how hard it is. Uh, I have And then they're going to watch great... next week just to see what he says that they can get angry Wait. about again. I love it. Wait, I, I give up one thing to say. That, what you described, just running around like a chicken with your head cut off, that sounds exactly like a rogue when you catch him out of stealth. Oh! Oh! (laughs) (laughs) Wow! You know, there's only two two things that that kill me: warlocks, which is why I'm raging so much on them, and and uh, uh, fury warriors. End of story. But you have cloak of skill. How how do you lose to warlocks? (laughs) Cloak of skill. You mean my oh shit button? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. It's. I just you know rogues. It's just. It's just reaction, you know. Bridger, I guess uh, we're on the same page here. It's uh, it, it, you can never expect how your next encounter will be with a rogue. Whereas nearly every class in in WoW, Aeon, whatever games you've played, you know exactly the same skills, no matter what you're coming up against, for the most part. And it, it is different for higher tier players, but I'm speaking of the the mass majority. So, I actually enjoyed the. Druid for a similar reason because the way that I played my feral druid at least when I was questing and and you know I tried to play in PvP. I don't know if it was the most effective way But it felt more fun to play it this way was to be able to you know Swap into various forms for whatever the situation you know 
required so that it was more dynamic than just staying in cat form constantly and just being a rogue. Like, if I'm just going to stay in the cat form all the time, then why don't I just go make a rogue? I'd rather be able to, you know, swap into the bear, swap back, you know, swap into cat form to start it out, and then once I get some damage in, if I start to take damage, swap back into casting form, throw some heals on me, some hots, then pop in a bear form to, to tank my way through the last bit of the fight. That kind of felt a lot more interesting and, and dynamic than it did... Um, to, to just stay in one form or another. And that's a reason that uh, that I enjoyed that. I also enjoyed the Shaman kind of for that reason, because even though the Shaman didn't play as dynamically as a rogue, I like running up to people and hitting them with things and blasting them with magic. I don't know why. <laughs> but I had, I had a Shaman before it was OP, by the way. I, I like I love my Shaman when I made it. I, was the, I, I chose Shaman before everybody found out how OP it was. Anyway, we're getting off topic. <clears throat> Let me pose the next question. Um... What do you guys think is the closest, mechanically speaking, to Guild Wars 2 out of all the MMOs out there or any other game that you can think of? Easily Warhammer. Okay. I any mean, I've said, I've said that before. I mean, that's, you're talking just PvP in general, right? Yeah, just combat mechanics, I would say. I would say right now Warhammer, but that's because we don't know what like the new energy bars are going to be yet. Because in Warhammer, everyone had like that one energy bar that would constantly like regenerate back up, but we don't know like what they're replacing that with. No, that is a mystery. Anybody else? What was the question? I was paying attention to the chat. <laughs> the chat, <laughs> always the chat. Um, what do you think is the closest an uh, uh, out there to what Guild Wars Two combat is like right now, mechanically speaking? Oh, it's hard to say. It's so original. Like, I think it's diff difficult to draw a parallel. It's 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 a weird answer, but I think it's Eve Online actually. And oh, the reason I true. say that, I can see that. Play so the game when you're not playing. <laughs> what? The game that no, I'm not playing. Yeah. The complexity of everything is definitely near to that. Well, I wouldn't necessarily think for the complexity, but the the thing about Guild Wars 2 that makes it so different is that your skills are dependent upon the gear, the weapons that you bring into battle. The weapon type specifically. So um, in EVE, the capacity of your ship, what it can do, the skills that it can use are based entirely upon what you equip it with. If you equip it with lasers, you can shoot lasers. If you equip it with missiles, it will shoot missiles. But you have to make those decisions ahead of time and sort of build your ship. In the same way, when you build your class in Guild Wars 2, you're going to choose a couple weapon sets. You're going to like, well, I'm going to go with great sword, and I'm going to go with, you know, sword and war, war, uh, war horn. And then I'm going to take this healing skill and these three utility skills and this ultimate skill. So you're building your, your class in the same way that you'd build a ship for a specific role uh, in, in, um, in EVE. And in EVE, the same ship can have multiple roles depending upon how it's built. A small ship can be a tackler or it can be sort of an assassin interceptor uh, in the hands of different people with different builds. So I kind of think that EVE is the closest kind of analogy to the mechanics of the game, but obviously th there's very big differences between the two games. But I think that aspect of it um, kind of pushes me towards EVE. Let's talk about Warhammer for a minute, because I always thought Warhammer had some of the coolest class mechanics out there. After playing WoW and all the others, Warhammer had some amazing class mechanics. What'd you get, what were your guys' favorites from there? I played exclusively in Archmage. Um, I led a guild to um, become something... Very notable. Um, and with my Archmage, uh, I don't know if you've ever played the class, uh, but essentially you would uh, you would have different specs, like you would expect any uh, any WoW clone. To, <laughs> sorry, but it, it was some, similar to WoW clone. Definitely. Um, you would have three different specs and such, but no matter what spec you went, you had this mechanic where uh, if you casted healing spells, you would basically generate a a bonus for your offensive skills. So I'll give you an example. Let's say I cast uh, heal three times. Well, then the next fireball, just one time that I cast at a uh, at an enemy, would do let's say forty percent more damage. And the more healing skills I casted before I casted that offensive skill, it would do that much more damage, and it would stack up to five times. Just the same around. If I was just a really offensive archmage. And then I saw that I, a tank of mine, or that I had a player that was just about to die, I could, for the for the first healing skill, throw the biggest heal you'd ever seen because I had been casting so many offensive skills. Now, 
I'm I'm kind of I have tunnel vision here because I didn't play any other class. I love my archmage, but I thought that mechanic was really really neat. Um, the fact that you you felt even though if you were specced into offensive, you know, and you didn't have a lot of healing attributes, that you every so often you could throw one very very big heal down. I thought that was really neat, and I saved so many people's lives doing that. And um, just the same way around, if I wanted to play a healer like a heal bot. I could do that, but then if I saw this guy was out in the distance and he was like half HP and I had just casted five heals, I would throw my biggest, strongest uh, uh, cleansing flare, which was one of the big AoE nukes in that game, and just ob obliterate everybody right there because I had been casting so many healing spells. I thought it was a really neat mechanic. Definitely there agreed. Was, there was like a balance thing with that. I think the whole like the whole idea was like a balance yeah. where... I think that was like the lore too. It was like they were balancing like power, high magic, or something. Like yeah, that. high magic versus like other magic or something. That worked out pretty well because I played Archmage for a little bit there too, and then I went to White Lion, which was like. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I actually I really... played a shaman, which was the same exact mechanic, but using but on the uh, the side of destruction. <laughs> but I... I I agree with you. I love that mechanic. Yeah, I played a Swordmaster too. Do we have anybody here that played Swordmaster? I played Swordmaster, but I, Sword I have Master. a hard time remembering it. I know it, Master, it had a lot of combos, uh, right? Well, yeah, you had uh, – they literally called theirs balance. Um, you mm -hmm. had um, – I, I only played it up to level 20, but I remember specifically um, like certain skills. You, you basically were this had this giant great sword that was the, the theme of the class, and it was really cool looking when you attacked and stuff. But certain skills would would – basically change your stance you know and if you built up to an aggressive stance and you s did this skill that s spun your sword flying well as in as, as you would imagine if, if you really had a great sword in your hand and you just did a, a huge broad swing your balance gets knocked off and it knocked you back down to a lower stance um i thought that was a really neat mechanic it's just warhammer had all uh, had all of these unique mechanics they, they tried to do uh, what I think Guild Wars 2 is going to is going to do successfully, and, and that's to change the way you play any any class. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're talking about engineer and stuff, but I think we're going to find that every single class, uh, Guardian and uh, the soon to be released uh, Mesmer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> you know, I got to say that every single cast we do. Um, yeah, I, I think I think it's going to be completely different. And, and everybody, you know, you, you're thinking in your head, I want to play a spellcaster, you know. But we're that's thinking too broad. You got to think more along the lines that I want to play a class that is strictly based around what my opponent does, you know, like the mesmer, for example. Or I want to play a class that I can lead up certain skills to do what I want to do, like the thief. Um, I think that the whole idea of saying I just want to play a healer or I just want to play a spellcaster or a melee DPS, I think those terms are going to be thrown out the window with these new mechanics, and uh, that's a good thing. Definitely. Yeah. Instead of being defined by role, it's going to sort of be defined by the style of play instead, which, exactly. is, which is going to be definitely very interesting. I also um, I liked the it, the the bright wizard was the uh, and the sorcerer in Warhammer had some pretty cool mechanics. It was a pure push your luck mechanic. They had a um, I don't remember what they called it, like a chaotic, you know, or or fire or whatever. That every time you cast a, a spell, that would be like a fireball, damaging flame wall, whatever. This ball would slowly fill up, and the more full it was, the higher the chance that you had of doing a critical hit. But also, the higher the chance that the spell would backfire and damage you for half the damage of the spell. So it was, you know, sort of a push your luck thing. Now you're at, you know, 50% chance for a critical hit, but 10, 15, 20% chance of, uh, of, of backfiring. And at some point, you had to either have the spell backfire on you, or you could use a release skill that would release all of your stored up, you know, chaotic energy and bring you back down to zero and do a little bit of damage at the same time. That was kind of a cool mechanic, but it was really one one angle, very one-dimensional mechanic. I, I disagree. I, I think our, whatever you want to call it, RNG, random you know, kickbacks, random stuns, random dodges, all of that uh, nonsense has no place in MMOs. I'm sorry. Um, I, I think it, 
everything should be structured. I, it's like, uh, it, who's played Super Smash Brothers, the the latest one? <laughs> Brawl. Uh, yeah, yeah, Brawl. All right, Brawl. All right, Melee. You know, I played it pretty competitively. Melee had a great tournament scene. It, it was it was awesome. Um, a lot of big names. And they went to Brawl. They they basically brought the whole game over, trying to promote the esports scene and such there, if if you call it that. And they added this mechanic called tripping. And I'm not going to really go yep. into it, but it ruined everything. So if the engineer, for example, Bridger, has a a random chance of their gun misfiring, and I play an engineer and that happens to me, I'll be rage quitting that class because it's <laughs> uh, it. It's random stuff like that has no place, and that's what I love about the dodging system, you know. And wow, if I uh, my little rogue here, if I had uh, a ton of evasion, it was a completely random thing that if you ran up to me and attacked, assuming you weren't a warrior, uh, that you would either hit or miss me. And and I think that was you know as much as I love my rogue and stacking evasion and laughing at paladins, um, it was. Still, it just felt kind of gimmicky, you know, because I could just stand there and not take any damage. But he's clearly swinging this huge hammer in my face, and it's going you know? right through your model. <laughs> but so, but yeah. Guild Wars Two does it shows you that you can accomplish that same thing, but do it in a less random way. Like when you blind somebody, they could have just made it so that you know for the next ten seconds they have fifty percent chance to miss. But instead, they just said, "Yeah, your next your your next swing automatically misses. Whatever you do, you're just one one shot, definite miss, and then it's done. That's it. Well, There's no randomness, but you still get the same effect." One thing I really like about the dodging, well, since Freelancer brought it up, is like the limited amount there is to it. So it's like a resource in a way. Right now, you can't just keep like, "Oh, I'm just gonna keep dodging everything." <laughs> you keep throwing at me. It's gonna be great. Like but it's like, "Oh no, this big <laughs> attack is coming. I better dodge this one." But then I'm a, could blind the next one. So coming back to that whole idea of sort of making those really tactical decisions, that's in there, and that's for every class. The ability to dodge and have mm -hmm. that limited dodge. I'd like to invite you guys on. Uh a little after launch day to Lion's Arch, we'll have a big dodgeball game where we all roll elementalists, <laughs> and we'll uh, we'll stand across the street and we'll just throw fireballs at each other. You know, it'll be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> if only we could like break the game just to give infinite dodge just for one section, just 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 to see everybody going through a city, just rolling along, just keep just this line of people rolling down the street, and just to see everybody's reaction, that would be awesome. Anyway. Um, so the other thing, speaking of that, is, is the way that the Guardian works with the Aegis and the sort of – it's not a random chance to do damage every, you know, every time you hit. It's every fifth hit will be a hit which does extra damage. Again, you provide the same sort of feeling of randomness without actually having randomness. You can control it as the player, and that gives, that gives more skill – Allow the chance to, to uh, show itself within the gameplay, which I'm just, oh, it's going to be awesome. I agree with that. I mean, uh, just being able to equip, like, something fast, you know, get those five hits in or at least four hits in, and then you know that your next hit is going to have this burning sensation of equipped to it. Bring out your big, you know, your big great hammer or, you know, your, your great sword or something, and then do your most powerful attack, and now it has burning on it. So it's sort of like you can kind of, almost play with the numbers and uh, play with the numbers in a way and kind of just like um set up what you're going to do and how you're literally going to kill someone almost <laughs> like the rng feels the reason rngs are an mmo and i know i say this a lot but it's sort of like a leftover from like the old school kind of rpgs and like how this mmorpgs have evolved over time the idea that there's been dice rolls for like tons and tons and tons of different sets like how much damage you do whether you hit or miss whether you dodge whether it's parried all these crazy things and with this more dynamic combat system that Guild Wars 2 is introducing, they don't need the RNG. They don't need to be rolling dice for those different values. I, I would say, though, that there is definitely a place to have some kind of randomness in games, especially, um, and, and not a huge amount, controllable randomness, I guess you could say, because if everything is deterministic, then... Every situation is going to have a single more op most optimal way to get out of it. And the only difference is what your opponent does. And that is always useful, which is why PvP or multiplayer games have always appealed to me more than single player and AI. Because when your opponent changes the situation, it can make a more interesting fight. But let's take 
Company of Heroes, for example. Company of Heroes, the units all have a range of damage, a chance for accuracy, for, you know, different things. Now, they usually perform in a specific way, and you can expect them to perform a specific way. But every once in a while, they perform exceptionally good or exceptionally poorly, and that changes the game. That uh, provides replay value. If every time you played the game, the opening riflemen always beat the Volks, Volks Grenadiers, on the opening fight, then every single game, the most optimal thing for, to do would be for the Volks Grenadiers to always run away from the riflemen, and then you have a very static metagame. But if every game is just subtly different, just a little bit, it doesn't have to be ridiculous amounts of, let's throw buckets of dice and find out what happens, but just a little bit. Maybe the riflemen all have, you know, a certain chance to hit, and they miss a couple of times too many, and as a result, now the Volks get the upper hand, and now the metagame changes just for this one game. I enjoy that a lot. I enjoy the hell out of that. But it has to be balanced really well. As Freelancer said, and I completely agree with you, um, too much randomness is just death to any kind of skill-based game. So you do have that randomness, though, already. I mean, it's... Uh, I'll give you a good example. A good example of randomness is what occurs naturally. It's... Um, you coming up against a elementalist, and you're, you're mentioning with, you know, well, let's just say it like this. You come up against an elementalist, depending on who's playing that elementalist, they are going to use different setups, different, uh, you know, they'll throw different kinds of skills at you, and that there is your randomness. True. A bad example of randomness is when I'm playing Team Fortress 2, I'm a scout, I come up behind a heavy with my bat, I beat out him four times, he turns around and insta-crits me with his fist. Um, you know, that that kind of randomness makes me rage. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, it's anti-competitive, it, yeah. Well, yeah it's, so it's, it, it's, it's there, I understand it's there, like crits, for example, we didn't really talk about that, but the <laughs> idea of just randomly critting, you know, it, it's... It's one of those things that's there to make you excited and change, you know, it's like when you get it, it's like, oh, oh that was awesome, you know. But I, I, I guess I'm the type of gamer that prefers, you know, sk the, the skill rewarding my crit, you know, a headshot, for example. Except, you know, what if we played Battlefield 3 and when you're shooting your MP5 randomly, every 30 bullets you shot was golden and insta-killed everybody? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> can, can it's like the flashlight. It? It's like the flashlight, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a way to do the critical hit thing and not have it be so game-changing. You can still make things interesting, but instead of doing double damage, just have it do like 25% more damage. And no, instead of no, one-shotting no. you with the fist, no. it'll just do a lot of damage. There's like one game that I know has almost no RNG to it, and that's StarCraft 2. And StarCraft, the first one, there's like no RNG in that game. Thank you. And that, and now and look at StarCraft's esports scene, you know? But that's it's why like I don't like StarCraft. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, that's not true. Uh, the deterministic factor isn't it. It's, it's, there's other reasons why I don't like StarCraft 2, but that's another podcast entirely. Oh. Um, so we're coming close to, <laughs> to, close to the end here. Um, any other uh, comments that anybody didn't get to get in over the course here? Any, uh, any comments from the chat room about something you think we missed? I actually kind of agree with you, um, Freelancer, on what you said about RNG. Um, one thing I absolutely hated, I'm bringing it back to Aeon, uh, was the Ranger, and he had he or she had this one move called Stunning Shot. Mm -hmm. Great move on the tooltip. Sound oh, awesome. Stun your target. It'll deal one to like 5,000 damage. <laughs> Some, no, literally. Sometimes it'll like, you'll hit, you'll hit like a mage and you'll be like, yes, I just one shot at that guy. And then you'll hit like a person who's like five levels lower than you for like three. I'm just like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> so I, 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 I think a, 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 a wee bit of RNG um, a little luck, you know. You know, it's fine to you know sprinkle on the um, sprinkle on the game, but if you you know if it's a, if it's move defining or if it's game defining, just please take it out. And the other thing to think about with regards to randomness is the more randomness there is, the more dependable it will be. So, for example, if you have a game where each of us roll a die and the higher number wins, and I'm rolling a d20 and you're rolling a d10. You could still win with that D10 pretty easily. But if we play the same game 70 times, I'm going to win the majority of those games because it will the probability will even out. So in a situation where you have a lot of dice rolling, and Company of Heroes is my example, has a lot of dice rolling. Every single time somebody shoots, it has to modify the chance that that shot hits by 
the enemy's cover by the distance and by the firing unit's weapon type. But is and that really random then? I mean, you just mentioned the variables that are required to determine the damage. Is it really random? It doesn't sound like it is. Well, it's it's still always a percent chance to hit. So let's say the accuracy is 80% with this weapon at this range, and the opponent is in light cover, so that reduces the accuracy by another 30% or something like that. Then it rolls a die, a D100, and okay, if it's over 50%, then it hits. If it's below 50%, it misses. So it's there's still a random factor in there. But the fact that every single shot is random, and the fact that units can take you know, 30 seconds to a minute to take enough damage to die means there's enough dice being rolled where you can be relatively certain of the outcome of a battle based on the units that are that are happening. But every once in a while, especially from a spectator standpoint, something crazy will happen. And that's why our shows are, are so awesome. But you can still control that. You can still get out of there when something bad happens, usually. Um, it isn't nearly as... It's not game-changing, is what I'm trying to say. It's, it's dependable enough that it's not game-changing, but it's still interesting enough that it changes the game and doesn't. And it makes sure that the same thing isn't always going to be the optimal move every single time. Yeah, but see, Company of Heroes works in that respect because it's not like your, your riflemen go up to... That there are sandbags and start shooting at Volk's Grenadiers, and randomly get headshots. Can you imagine that? It, it's it's not in that respect. I guess that's what we're kind of talking about when we say RNG. We're talking about the mm -hmm. the extreme stuff that just has no place. Right. Um, and I agree with you on that. Where no matter yeah, how so. good you are, if the other guy gets lucky, you just lose. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> if you put your guys in a position that that is. Uh, not as beneficial. I mean, that's one thing. But if they, if he randomly, uh, let's Guild Wars Two is aiming for esports, right? And let's say we have a arena match, and my team for the first round just happens to get lucky, and um, let's say crits. You know, we just get a bunch of lucky crits. What do you think is going to happen to the the seriousness of that game? I agree completely. Yep, that's, that's know, just going to make it go. Now, what gonna you're mentioning. Seriously. Yeah. Now, what you're mentioning is, is is a natural randomness, and it's based on skill. Um, there isn't an extreme there. So, if if we're a bunch of elementalists and we're coming up against a bunch of elementalists, just theoretically, um, if we're throwing random skills and we're missing all of our attacks, and there's a chance that we might hit because of where their enemy's positioned, that's still that's the kind of RNG that that you'd expect because it's a ranged uh, weapon or skill. It's it's the it's the crits you know it's that fireball that randomly you throw out of your hand that's like a huge meteor that would be my issue. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I mean, as far as I know, there's not too much. No, there isn't. There isn't at all. Yeah, and I mean, it also the things that are kind of random are the, are the ones that are controllable. Are the things like you can drop your AOE type spells or your skills on specific things. You have to target them. And I really enjoy the fact that you have to target some of the range stuff in Guild Wars 2 rather than just relying on, okay, I've got this guy as my target, now I just hit all these buttons and he dies. You have to actively choose, okay, he's running that way, so I'm going to try and drop it in front of him so by the time he gets there, you know, it's sort of more of a skill move rather than a let's try random, you know, okay, I've got a pretty high ability, you know, I've got really high dexterity, so this shot should work and hit two and find out if it does or doesn't work based on a random number generator. So I'm you know glad that those skill things are in there. You know what sold me on Guild Wars 2 as far as RNG? The, um, the very, very first video that came out, the trailer, if you guys remember the Elementalist uh, raised her hand in the air and shot down a bunch of meteors coming down on these little... Uh, Knoll looking creatures, mm -hmm. right? If you watch closely, and I did because it that's something that that bothers me. You know, I, I have to look into all the little details. One of the details I looked into was to see where these fireballs were dropping and if they were actually hitting these creatures that were crossed in the AOE. There were two of those knolls, if I remember right, that uh, I'm assuming they're knolls, they were like rat creatures, right? Um, that uh. Well, the ogres, actually, is what I'm thinking of. Um, the fireballs never directly hit the ogre, but they still got hit by the AoE skill. So that tells me right there that instead of making it where, um, it, it, you know, it could have been random. They could have scripted it where the fireball came down, and unless it hit directly hit the ogre, then it wouldn't have worked, right? Um, but it seemed to me like they were aiming in the direction that as so long as I lay down the AoE, and I'm sure this will apply to other scenarios as well, that 
character, that player, that monster is going to get hit by it. And once I saw that, I, I was I was pretty glad to see that because they could have gone in the other direction with it and added the RNG, which is the fact of I cast you know meteor shower on you, and then it just so happens that every one of them misses everything but you. And you're going to laugh at me and kill me, and guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to blame it on RNG. The fact that that meteor shower, for, for God's sake, should have killed you. And um, I'm glad that's not in the game. Right. So. All right. Final, final thoughts. We're going to wrap it up here. Um, like, oh, you go. Go, go, go. I, I was just going to say I like. I do like that crits are RNG because it's a controllable RNG where you can pump up your crit rating if you want to. And I think that's acceptable. Um, kind of like a summary type deal for me is 